Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8:16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8:31. I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, the Israeli government is working to provide Christians with special status in the Holy Land. The Israeli Knesset has passed the first reading of a bill granting Christian Arabs independent status. The legislation is sponsored by member of Knesset Yariv Levin, who feels that Christian Arabs should not fall into the same category as Muslim Arabs in Israel. He said this is a historic and important step that could balance the state of Israel and connect us to the Christians. He went on to say that Christian Arabs are our natural allies, and they differ from the Muslims who want to destroy the Jewish state from within. Nearly 80 percent of the 161,000 Christians in Israel identify themselves as Arabs. They live in Muslim-majority communities leaving them vulnerable to persecution from their Muslim neighbors. Arab Christian leaders have called on their congregants to stand with Israel by serving in the Israeli army and becoming functioning members of Israeli society. Unfortunately, the Muslim Arab community of Israel has attempted to stifle this movement by violently lashing out at Christians who ally themselves with the Jewish state. Shadi Halul, the head of the Christian IDF Officers Forum, attended the Knesset session and said that his community supports the legislation and is praying that the bill will pass successfully. The Presbyterian Church has taken an anti-Israel stance and is calling Zionism the root of the conflict in the Holy Land. A new study guide released by the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of Presbyterian Churches in the United States is now teaching that Zionism has destroyed the lives of the indigenous Palestinian population and disrupted rich Jewish communities throughout the world. The teaching guide also accuses Israel of being uninterested in making peace with the Palestinians. It features articles by vehemently anti-Israeli Muslim scholars and even features a section on Holocaust denial. Evangelical Christian support of Israel is slammed as an uncritical endorsement of Israel's occupation and settlement of Palestinian lands. Jewish leaders expressed their disappointment with the guide, and a representative for B'nai B'rith said that the document promotes virulent hatred of Israel, as well as animosity toward the historic rights and fundamental sensibilities of Jews. Another prominent rabbi said that the study guide is reminiscent of medieval Christian polemics against Judaism and serves as another example of the ongoing effort to demonize Israel by a cadre of people who want to see the dismantlement of the Jewish state. Denmark has officially banned kosher slaughter. The Danish Minister of Food and Agriculture has signed a regulation into law that effectively bans the biblical slaughter of animals. Suggesting that kosher slaughter is inhumane, he said that animal rights come before religion. The Jewish process of shechita is arguably the most humane form of animal slaughter, and Rabbi Menachem Margolin, the director of the European Jewish Association, said it has been proven scientifically that kosher slaughtering does not allow the animal to feel pain. Israeli Chief Rabbi David Lau said kosher slaughter is the most humane of all existing methods and prevents animal suffering. Israeli and Jewish organizations believe that the ban on kosher slaughtering is motivated by anti-Semitism, and they've urged Denmark to repeal the law. A highly influential Palestinian peace activist has been sentenced to life in prison in Jordan. Mudar Zarein has repeatedly called for the establishment of an independent Palestinian state within the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. 
And other moderate Palestinians have also begun to promote the increasingly popular movement as the majority of Jordanians are Palestinian. In apparent anger over the threat that the Palestinian population poses to his throne, King Abdullah made an example of Zahrain by sentencing him to life in prison with hard labor in absentia. Analysts say that Abdullah has also begun to strategically distance himself and his government from the Jewish state. The Jordanian parliament voted just last week to reject the existence of the state of Israel and called for the establishment of a Palestinian state in the heartland of Judea and Samaria, with Jerusalem to be recognized as the sole capital of the future Palestinian state. The parliament also issued a statement expressing its wish that the Palestinians should have full sovereignty over the entire city of Jerusalem, including all Christian holy sites in addition to the Muslim houses of worship. During his recent summit to Washington, the Jordanian monarch discussed the strengthening of ties with U.S. President Obama between the two countries, after which Obama pledged over $1 billion in aid to the Hashemite Kingdom. Palestinian Media Watch has released the details of an Arab terrorist who plotted a fictitious terrorist attack for monetary gain. Israel Now News has extensively reported on the financial incentives provided by the Palestinian Authority to convicted terrorists. According to the report, Husni Najjar, who was previously convicted for planning a suicide bombing, also planned a second attack in order to receive a larger payout from the PA. The terrorist claims the plot was meant to lure Israeli security services into arresting him so that the PA would reward him with a larger monthly stipend. Itamar Marcus, the director of Palestinian Media Watch, said the testimony of this Arab terrorist confirms our organization's contention that the PA's policy of paying high salaries to terrorists during their imprisonment in Israel and after their release not only rewards terror, but also constitutes motivation for terror. Attempted assault charges have been filed against two Arab residents of Jerusalem for hiring a hitman to stab an Israeli police officer. Investigators believe that the father and son conspired to attack the liaison officer in charge of security for the Christian community in the old city. The Arab men arranged tours to Christian sites for profit and allegedly harassed and threatened the officer repeatedly while blaming him for a decrease in tourism to the sites where they worked. They are accused of ultimately hiring an undercover cop to fatally stab the officer, but security forces intervened and arrested the suspects before anyone was hurt. Dozens of Israeli ambulances and first responders were denied entry into Egypt after Muslim terrorists detonated a bomb, killing three South Korean Christian tourists and their Egyptian bus driver. Despite the ill preparedness of the Egyptian authorities to treat the wounded, Egyptian officials barred Israeli ambulances and paramedics from entering the border town of Taba to provide medical treatment at the scene. Many of the wounded claimed to have waited hours for treatment of injuries sustained during the blast. Hamas has reiterated its stance against any possible peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. In a fiery statement issued from the Gaza Strip, the leader of Hamas said that his terrorist organization will not be bound by any agreement made by Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas or his Fatah party. Addressing his bitter rival personally, Ismail Haniya said that no one has authorized Abbas to speak in the name of the people, in the name of Hamas or any other faction. The United States is pressuring Israel to make painful concessions to reach a peace agreement with the Palestinians, although according to Hamas, any such agreement would not be honored. Last week, two Israeli startup companies were acquired by foreign high-tech giants. Ray Kuten Inc., a Japanese-owned e-commerce mammoth, has purchased the Israeli instant messaging app provider Viber. Ray Kuten reportedly paid $900 million for Viber. And Google acquired Slick Login, an Israeli technology which provides military-grade security to users logging into specific services. That acquisition is said to be valued at several million dollars. And that concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein.
Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in yet another beautiful day on our rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Jeremy Gimpel, the Deputy Director of World Mizrahi. Jeremy, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Jeremy, you don't need much of an introduction for our viewers. You were on our show for a little bit of a time, and you're from thelandofisrael.com, which everyone knows well. But now you're doing something very interesting. You're working with World Mizrahi. Tell our viewers, what is World Mizrahi? So World Mizrahi is the World Religious Zionist Movement. It was founded in 1902, and as we all know, modern Zionism uh, was predominantly a secular movement. And for the most part, most believing Jews, most Torah observant Jews said, oh, this is a secular movement, this is an anti-God movement, this can't be, we're backing off, let the secular Jews do what the secular Jews do, we're going to stay here, you know, in Europe or wherever they may be. And there was one stream of Judaism that said, you know, the fact that it's a secular movement is in fact perhaps an indication that this is the fulfillment of prophecy. And this is a religious obligation and a religious opportunity to fulfill the dream of 2,000 years and return to the land of Israel, not as a secular movement, but as a religious Zionist movement in the fulfillment of God's promise. You know, it's interesting you say that Zionism was started as a secular movement. How is that possible? This is clearly the fulfillment of God's prophecy. We see every day prophecies being fulfilled. How did the uh, religious establishment at the time miss that fact? It's a great question. I think that maybe times in Europe were so rough that the uh, imagination couldn't grasp that we would actually be able to make it back to Israel on our own. The pogroms, the Holocaust, the Inquisition, the Crusades, Eventually, we just began to believe that the Messiah would come and bring us back, even though intrinsically the first commandment given to the first Jew, was given to Abraham, was go forth from your land to the land of Israel, meaning intrinsically within biblical Jewish thought, moving to Israel is, is a part and parcel of being Jewish. And for the most part, we just said, well, we're waiting for the Messiah. And I think that the religious Zionist movement saw that instead of waiting for God to act, we could be partners with God and fulfilling his movement together with him. And that's really the foundation of the World Mizrahi movement. Today, religious Zionism is part and parcel with the state of Israel. It's in every stream of society here. There's even a political party that represents religious Zionism. Why do you think religious Zionism has become such an important part of Israeli society? Because ultimately, secular Zionism was really, we have to just create a state for the Jews because life outside as a minority is terrible. And pretty much that's been fulfilled. Meaning there is a state, there's a place that we can go to now, but now what? And secular Zionism doesn't really have an answer for that question. And only religious Zionism right now, as I understand it, provides an answer for the destiny of the Jewish people that's to unfold here. Now that we have a state, we have roads, we have an army, well now what? And we're really here on a higher mission. And not that Zionism is over, it's really now the ultimate Zionism is really beginning now in creating a just, compassionate society based on biblical values that really we now have the opportunity to fulfill what Abraham was trying to accomplish when he first left. And that really can only be fulfilled if we really believe that this is is a faithful opportunity to fulfill the Word of God. Well, something that's been amazing over the last decade is this incredible alliance between religious Zionists and Christian Zionists. Why do you think that Christian Zionists and religious Zionists are working together in this day and age? Well, ultimately, I think that we both see that this is an opportunity to be a part of God's plan. You know, everyone wants to know, how can I be within God's will? How can I know what's right and what's wrong? And we really have the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, as our guide. And I think that most Christians that have sort of returned to the fundamentals of their own belief, which really is the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, they see that the state of Israel is the fulfillment of all of the visions of the prophets of Israel are now coming to pass. And they're saying, wow, well, if God is with Israel, then I'm with Israel. And religious Zionists are, of course, saying, well, God is with Israel, well, I'm already in Israel. And so that's uh, just such a natural partnership that ultimately, I believe, will um, bear tremendous fruits as we move forward. We see in America that there are a lot of religious people in the Jewish community who love Israel, support Israel, but they haven't moved to Israel. How can they justify the fact that they believe in the Bible, they love Israel, but they live there? So one of the core missions of the religious Zionist movement is really to bring that question to the forefront of the Jewish mind, is that this is now the calling of our generation is the ingathering of the exiles. But I mean, on the other hand, we really have to be conscious that imagine you have to leave your family, you have to leave a secure job, you have to leave a language and a culture that you're familiar with, travel to the Middle East in a culture and a language that you're not familiar with, with no job, that's a real testament of faith. And the fact that so many Jews from around the world have made that leap of faith 
is, in my mind, a witness that the Jewish people are the embodiment of what faith is meant to be in a biblical sense. That it's not just believing that there is God, but rather taking that belief and converting it into action. That faith without action is not really faith at all. And that is the essence of the State of Israel and the Jewish people that are returning here. Jeremy, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I think that the calling of the generation, particularly to the Christian audience that's watching this program, is that a line is being drawn in the sand and ultimately you're going to have to make a choice. Where right now you could be a little bit on the fence. I like Israel, but I'm not going to be too vocal about it. I don't want to offend the people around me. But ultimately you're going to have to make a stand. Are you with us or are you against us? And to always remember that God is with Israel. We're the apple of his eye. And by casting your lot with Israel, you're casting your lot with God. And so ultimately, I believe that a beautiful partnership can be based uh, on faith, trust, and ultimately the Tanakh. Thank you, Jeremy, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. This is Jerusalem, Israel's capital city. It's an ancient and modern treasure that is beyond belief. There's a little bit of Israel in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. Jerusalem, a historical journey through archaeology and art. Jerusalem, a mosaic of different peoples, faiths, and nationalities. Nevertheless, despite this diversity, under the sovereignty of Israel, Jerusalem is a city that works. But has it always been this way? The first historical mention of Jerusalem is in the Bible, in the era of the patriarchs. King David declares Jerusalem as Israel's capital, known from that point on also as Zion. His son, King Solomon, builds the first temple. But the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians, and the Jews are exiled. King Cyrus's declaration enables the Jews to return and rebuild the temple. Alexander the Great's conquests include Jerusalem. However, his successors desecrate the temple. Which leads to the Maccabees' revolt against the Greeks' imposition of Hellenism. The Roman Empire seizes control and King Herod renovates the temple. A large-scale revolt against a corrupt and vicious Roman reign fails. The second temple is destroyed and the Jews are banned from Jerusalem. Sixty years pass and Bar Kokhba leads another revolt for the freedom of Jerusalem. But it fails after three years of battle. Jews are banned from the city renamed by the Romans Aelia Capitolina in order to eradicate its Jewish heritage. Roman Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity and reinforces the ban on Jews entering Jerusalem. A new religion, Islam, sweeps through the Middle East. Non-Muslims are declared second-class citizens. Crusaders conquer Jerusalem in a bloodbath of Jews and Muslims. 2,000 Jews are burned alive in the main synagogue and the city is depopulated of its previous inhabitants. The first organized mass Jewish return arrives from France and England. The Mamluks defeat the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem and building and renovating of synagogues and churches is banned. 
the great Mishnai commentator Rabbi Ovadia of Bartanura settles in Jerusalem. The Ottoman Empire takes over, imposing restrictions on Jews and Christians, and Sultan Suleiman rebuilds the walls. But as the empire declines, Jerusalem is badly neglected. Still, the Jewish people stream back, build new neighborhoods, and re-establish their majority by 1863. World War I breaks out. The Ottoman Empire collapses and makes room for a new Middle East. The British Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, declares the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. Britain receives a mandate to create a Jewish homeland, but forbids Jews from blowing the shofar or reading holy scrolls at the Western Wall. Thousands of Muslims are incited to unleash an attack against Jews in Jerusalem and Hebron. 86 Jews are brutally murdered, hundreds are wounded. UN Resolution 181 declares Jerusalem as a corpus separatum, a separate entity. A Jewish state is declared as Jerusalem is put under siege, conquered and divided. 58 synagogues are destroyed or desecrated. Harsh limitations are imposed on Jews and Christians for 19 years. The Six-Day War. Jerusalem is reunited and freedom and equality are restored. Throughout history, only Israel has protected the freedom of all peoples and faiths in Jerusalem. would be a vacation by a lake. But this is the Sea of Galilee. The wonders of Israel are beyond belief. There's a little bit of Israel in all of us. Come find the Israel in you. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Welcome to the ICEJ report. My name is Juha Ketala and I'm the International Director of our ministry. The Lord has called us both to Israel and to the nations. That's why we have our headquarters here in Jerusalem. You can see our building here behind me. And in the nations, we have our national branches. Now we as a ministry, we are like a funnel, like a pipe with a wide opening to channel the support and help from the nations into the lives of the individual citizens in Israel. We have had our physical presence here in Jerusalem since 1980. In our headquarters here in Jerusalem, we have a staff of about 40 people from uh, more than 12 different nations. And from here, we are spreading out to all Israel. And the Lord has enabled us to touch the different layers of the Israeli society. We have been doing it and we are doing it either by our, our ICEJ aid, social assistance programs and projects that are going to the north and south and east and west of Israel, or we are doing the touching of the layers of the Israeli society by our partnerships with many different various institutes here in Israel. Among them, for example, uh, the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus, enabling us to touch the national leadership of Israeli nation, the modern-day Israel, or we have a partnership with the Yad Vashem, the most prestigious, 
very well-known institute in Israel, the Holocaust Museum and the Educational Center. Now, this is what we are doing in Israel. Now, in the nations then, and this is vitally important, very, very important, in the nations, we are serving the body of Christ. Our message nourishes. It builds trust in the spirit of, of the believers. When we show from the Bible and from the history how God has been so faithful to the Israelites and the modern day Israelis. The Israelis are back in the modern day state of Israel here in the land. God is forever faithful. So we are serving the local body of Christ with our message. But we are, we are doing more than that. We are raising a global prayer on behalf of Israel in the nations. And we are also raising some other kind of support uh, in the nations. And we do this by reaching out to, to the national leaders and the decision makers in the countries. We are, we are speaking on behalf of Israel and raising understanding of the Israelis uh, and what kind of situations they have in the land. You need to be part of this. Within the last year alone, we were in more than 30 nations, almost 30 nations, from Israel, from Jerusalem. And this is in addition to what the national branches have been doing in more than 70 nations. We have been establishing new branches within the last year. In November last year, we had a new branch we established in uh, Sierra Leone. Then in February in Senegal and in Niger and then in May in, in Slovenia. So we have new branches. We have a vision to reach out to the Muslim countries. The Lord prophesied over us that we will establish 10 new branches in the Muslim countries. China is opening for us. Spanish-speaking world is opening for us. In Africa alone we have more than 20 nations to go into. You need to get involved. Do something practical. Click the donation button on our website and learn what, where you can put your monies in to support the ministry. Actions prevail over mere knowledge. Write a check. Pray for us. Remember, we are your embassy here in Jerusalem. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.